We come now to Psalm 20. And this is an amazing psalm that in some ways, when you take a look at the title of the psalm, and when I talk about the title, I mean the title in the Hebrew text. Again, it says, To the Chief Musician, a Psalm of David. We've seen many psalms in these first 20 psalms that have the same title. Again, to the chief musician, either referring to uh, the choir leaders among the Levites, the worship leaders, the music leaders, perhaps referring to the Lord himself, who is the chief musician, the one who invented music and is the greatest musician. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Now, that title in the Hebrew is the same, yet the psalm itself, Psalm 20, is different, notably because it's the voice of a multitude that prays on behalf of the king of Israel, in this case, David, as he is about ready to go into battle. Now, this is seen in the way that the psalm speaks in the first person plural. In other words, we. Uh, In verses 1 through 5, it speaks in the we. And in verses 7, 8, and 9, it speaks in the we. Now, in verse 6, the one that comes between those, the first person singular, I, is used. That's probably the response of either King David or maybe the high priest on his behalf. Nevertheless, this is a psalm of David. So maybe King David took a moment of spontaneous prayer by the people on his behalf, and maybe he shaped it into a song that would remember, that would bring to mind uh, sort of the spiritual strength and even the glory of what God was doing in that particular moment. So let's take a look here at the passage. We're talking about uh, Psalm 20, beginning here at verse 1. In verses 1 and 2, we read this. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. So here is a beginning, the first two verses, of a prayer that the people make on behalf of the king of Israel. They're saying, King, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Now, again, we don't come to the we until verse 5, but verse 5 makes it very clear that that and the verses preceding that come from the context of a group praying for the king. The Lord, answer the prayers of King David in the day of trouble, and and may the God of Jacob defend you. The picture here, as I said before, is of King David before battle, perhaps something like the battle he would fight against the Syrians in 2 Samuel chapter 10. We don't know, except David fought a lot of battles as king. But maybe it was at the tabernacle of God, offering prayers and sacrifices before the battle. And here, the onlooking multitude responds to the king's prayer with this cry. They cry out, verse 1, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Derek Kidner called this one of the most stirring of the Psalms. It sort of has this tense awareness of life and death issues that are soon to be resolved. And what he means by that statement is simply the idea that the battle is on the horizon and the people are praying for their king, that God would give him success and that God would preserve him. Now, I want to point something out here. With the eye of faith, we see that this also speaks to or points to the great battle that was fought by the one who's greater than King David. And you know who the one greater than King David is, Jesus, who's given that glorious title, the Son of David, and who is the King of Kings. Now, we can see how this prayer is being offered prophetically prophetically for Jesus as he pointed himself towards the cross, where Jesus would fight the greatest battle of all, the battle against sin, the battle against death, the battle against Satan's power. I I almost see angelic choirs singing or praying this to strengthen the Son of God. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. Now again, after the pattern of Hebrew poetry, The idea is intensively expressed by the use of repetition with slight variation. David was about to lead Israel into battle, and he needed the help of God in each of these ways. And again, with the eye of faith, we can see this applied to Jesus as he was going to endure the battle of the cross. 
And because King David, looking back to him again, was about to lead Israel as a whole into battle, the language is full of references appealing to the Lord, Yahweh, as the God of Israel. Check it out in verse 1. First of all, there's the reference to the Lord. That's Yahweh, the covenant name of God, according to the covenant that he made with Israel. Then in verse 1, you have the God of Jacob. That's remembering the great patriarch of Israel, from whom the twelve tribes came. Uh, Verse 2 mentions from the sanctuary. That's calling to mind the tabernacle, the center of worship for Israel as a nation. And then verse 2 mentions out of Zion. That's referring to the hills of Jerusalem. So we have this context uh, of sort of God uh, defending and blessing David on behalf of the nation. Matter of fact, the prayer that God would, look at it there in verse 2, strengthen you out of Zion is fitting for more than the field of battle. It's also appropriate for the church pulpit. You, you know, the, the, the pulpit of a church where the pastor preaches and teaches, that's a field of battle in a spiritual sense. I, I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said, this verse is a benediction befitting a Sabbath morning and may be the greeting either of a pastor to his people or a church to its minister. <laughs> the Lord strengthen you out of the pulpit the place where you're going to bring forth God's word. Now, verse 3, May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice, Selah. Now, again, sacrifices were commonly made at important moments, such as on the eve of battle. This is a prayer that the Lord would see and that the Lord would receive the sacrifices King David was going to make before he entered into warfare. And so the prayer is, on behalf of the people for their king, may he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Now, this understands something here, that not all sacrifices are accepted before God. Notice the prayers that God would accept your burnt sacrifice. This sort of just takes for granted that not every sacrifice is accepted before God. If sacrifices are not offered with faith and in accordance with the Levitical system that God established, they would not be remembered. They would not be accepted by God. And this reminds us of the important place of faith in the Old Testament sacrificial system. The person who brought the offering had to trust in the ultimate perfect sacrifice that God would one day provide, the one that each animal sacrifice pointed towards. If you want an illustration of that, look in Genesis chapter 22, when when, uh, God uh, told Abraham, offer your son as a sacrifice. Now, it's important to say God never intended that there would be a human sacrifice. God always intended that he would stop Abraham from this sacrifice. But God, testing Abraham, asked him to do it. And then Abraham understood that when when God stopped him, it all pointed towards a perfect sacrifice that God himself would provide. Matter of fact, provide on the very same place where Jesus himself was crucified. And so it says, again, verse 3, May he remember all your offerings. May he accept your burnt sacrifices. Now, did you notice that word at the end of verse 3? Selah. The idea in the Hebrew for this word, by the way, it occurs 74 times in the Old Testament, most of the time in the book of Psalms, but not only. The idea behind Selah is pause. Now, most people think it speaks of a reflective pause. It's a pause to meditate on the words that were just spoken. That's true. It could also be a musical instruction. It may speak of a musical interlude of some kind. I I don't want to uh, sound, you know, irreverent here, but perhaps Selah was something like the invitation for the guitar solo or the lyre solo or, or some kind of musical flourish. That's possible. It could be both. It could be while the musician performs for a moment, thoughtfully reflect upon what was just said. Now, we take this Selah in verse three 
as an opportunity to consider Jesus and to see that this prayer was appropriate for him as he faced the cross. The prayer was worthy to be prayed that God would indeed remember and accept the offering that Jesus made on the cross, which could rightly be called a burnt sacrifice because Jesus' offering on the cross was burned with the fire of God's righteous judgment. Now, I'm not talking about the literal fire, but God's judgment is often presented as a consuming fire in that metaphorical picture. Jesus held nothing back in his sacrifice. It was completely presented. And so it was in those ways, symbolically, a burnt sacrifice completely offered and under the fire of God's judgment. The prayer continues here in verse 4. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. You see, in this moment, King David had one desire, to defend the people of God and the kingdom that was in covenant with God. Therefore, it was a very good thing to pray. May he grant you according to your heart's desire. And we can trust this, that whenever our desires are in accord with the plan and will of God for us, we can pray this same prayer with confidence. You see, when the people of Israel prayed this prayer on David's behalf and they say, may he grant you according to your heart's desire, they could pray it with full cut. God wanted it because they knew what David's desire was. He wanted to defend the people of God. He wanted to defend the kingdom that was in covenant with God. That was something blessed by God. And we can ask God when we know we're praying according to the plan and will of God to answer our heart's desire. Another aspect of this is that we look to God to bring our desires more and more into conformity with his desires. That's just the course of Christian growth. So verse 4, May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. Again, David's purpose was victory for the people of God. That was a good and necessary prayer to pray. Now again, we keep coming back to Jesus, the King of Kings. David was the King of Israel. Jesus is the King of Kings we see this statement applied to the great desire and purpose for the king of kings as he went to battle to accomplish our salvation. With the perception of faith, we look to Jesus struggling in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we say to Jesus, may he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. You know, Jesus' heart's desire as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane was that he would fulfill the word of God and the work of God and the plan of God in every dimension. And God granted him that purpose. Now, on a personal level, we also see that God gives to each person a purpose to fulfill in his great plan of the ages. Have you ever thought about that? That that God gives to you a purpose a a, a plan, a role in his great plan of the ages. Now, the key to a life of fulfilled desire and achieved purpose is to find our place in his great plan. Instead of hoping to make God an actor in our plan, that's the way a lot of people approach us. God, you can be a character in the drama of my life. No, we want a role in God's plan of the ages. And listen, if you If you raise your children well, I'm thinking of fathers and mothers, if you work hard and raise your children well in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you are fulfilling God's great purpose and desire. That is part of your, it may not be the only aspect of your role, but that's part of your role. You work hard at your job and make a contribution to your kingdom, uh, to, to, excuse me, your community and to God's kingdom. That is part of fulfilling your role. You, you serve your neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ. That is part of fulfilling your role in what God has. Now, Jesus knew this fulfilled desire and purpose. When Jesus prayed before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, but on the night that he was to be betrayed, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 4. And one of the things he said in that great prayer of John 17 is this. Again, verse 4. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus had a sense that God had a purpose, a plan, and his desire was to fulfill that, and he did. The Apostle Paul also knew this fulfilled desire and purpose. 
It was shown by these words that Paul said toward the end of his earthly life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said this, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. God gave me a fight to fight, and I fought it. God gave me a race to run, and I ran it. I finished it. May God give us the same sense as well. Now, in verse 5 of Psalm 20, we come to the, uh, the more explicitly stated we. Notice this in verse 5. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your peti- uh, petitions. Again, verse 5. We will rejoice in your salvation. This was the confidence that the people had in King David's success. They had so much trust in God's deliverance that they had already set up their banners of joyful celebration. Those banners, I like what John Trapp, the old Puritan commentator, said about him. He said, those banners are our flags of defiance to the enemy or our tokens of triumph to God's glory who has given us the victory. I love the idea of a flag of defiance to the enemy. Jesus Christ is our victory, and our God will give us. In the name of our God, we will set up our banners. And, verse 5, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Once again, it is both the prayer and the confidence that God would hear and fulfill the prayers of the king. Again, once again, I just have to say, this was true both of David and the son of David, the king of Israel and the king of kings. Jesus prayed for success in his work on the cross, and it was unthinkable that the father would not answer the prayers of the son. Now, in verse 6, we see David's response. Maybe the response was given through the high priest, maybe it was David's, but here we see the, the speaking in the I. Uh, verses 1 through 5, it's in the we. Verses 7 through 9, it's in the we. But verse 6 is in the I. This is David's response. Ready? Verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. So here, King David expressed great confidence that the Lord would answer the prayers of his people. I've got my people praying for me. I can't lose. That's kind of David's attitude here. And let me tell you something. That's something that every servant of God believes and feels. When people are praying, when the people of God are praying for his work, God is going to get his work done. Let me tell you, that's that's one of the things I find great comfort with. Sometimes I'm just kind of amazed at the things that God has let me do, uh, at the extent of ministry that for me, thankfully, a lot of it's under the radar, but but it's an extent far beyond what I could have ever dreamed of. And one of the reasons I know people have prayed and are praying for me. I don't mind if you pray for me. I'd I'd enjoy it. I'd take that as a great privilege. If you would pray for God's blessing and, and God's success upon the work that I do for him in his kingdom. David felt, I've got people praying for me. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. And that's the king, his anointed. You see, in a sense, Every king of Israel was God's anointed because they were all appointed to their office by a literal anointing of oil poured out upon their head. That literal anointing with oil was a picture of the spiritual anointing that they had from the Holy Spirit need necessary for their duty of leading the people of God as king. So when he says, uh, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed, David's referring to himself as king. At the same time, it was also understood that there would come an ultimate anointed one, the perfect king of Israel, the Mashiach, that means the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, as in Psalm 2 and in other places. This was true of David and of Israel in his day, that the Lord saves his anointed and his people. But it's even more perfectly true of the ultimate and perfect anointed one. And you know who that is. Jesus Christ is the ultimate anointed of the Lord. And by the way, when it says there in verse 5, it says, uh, the Lord saves. Uh, We will rejoice in your salvation. In the name of our God, we'll set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill your petitions. Now verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. The verb saves there in verse 6 
is the same root as victorious. And you could translate that there in verse 6. I know the Lord will give victory to his anointed. Uh, Again, it's the same idea. And this word in Psalm 20, verse 6, save, the Lord saves his anointing. And in verse 9, save, Lord. It comes from the same root word in Hebrew as we get the name of Jesus. So there's almost like an echo, a reminder, a pointing towards the name of Jesus in verse 6 and in verse 9, just in the word saves. And it's true. When we think of how this especially applies to Jesus Christ, we say the Lord saves his Messiah. The Lord saves his anointed. The Father saved the Son from sin. It was as Jesus relied on God the Father that he walked a sinless life. The Father saved the Son from pride. The Father saved the Son from self-reliance. The Father saved the Son from doubt. The Father saved the Son from failure. The Father saved the Son from death. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, listen, David, did not Jesus have the divine power within himself to be saved from sin and pride and self-reliance and doubt and all the rest? Yes, he did. But from what we know, and, and we don't see these things completely clearly as it's revealed in Scripture, but from what we know, Jesus said that he did everything in reliance upon his Father. And so there's some way, either mostly or completely, we don't really know, but there's some way in which Jesus, who never stopped being God, let's make that very plain. If you can stop being God, you were never God to begin with. Jesus, who never stopped being God, nevertheless chose to not draw upon his own divine resources and instead relied upon God his Father for the resources to walk pure from sin, to stay away from pride, to not be self-reliant, to not give in to doubt. Again and again, Jesus chose to do this, either mostly or entirely. We don't, don't know for sure, but Jesus chose to do this in reliance upon God his Father. Again, not because Jesus did not have the divine resource within himself, but actually he chose that I'm going to rely on my Father. And so the Lord, the Father, saves his anointed. Matter of fact, it says there in verse 6, he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. You see, that confirmed and strengthens the idea that the Lord saves his anointed. He's saved by an answer. God's not silent to his anointed. It was true for King David. It's ultimately true of God the Son, Jesus Christ, the ultimate anointed one. He's saved from heaven. God hears and sends help from his throne. True for David, true for Jesus in an even greater sense. He's saved with power. Notice that phrase in verse 6, with saving strength. He's saved with the skill and favor, with the strength that comes from the right hand. And every one of those things is true for King David. Even more perfectly, they are true of the son of David, Jesus Christ, the ultimate anointed of the Lord. Psalm 20 is one of those glorious psalms that has in view what God was doing through King David right then and there. But even more perfectly, it has in view what God would and could do through the ultimate son of David, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just going to mention this uh, because we want to move on to verse 7. But I want you to consider that you have an anointing from the Lord as well. You're, You're not anointed as the king of Israel, as David was, nor are you the ultimate anointed one as Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, is anointed. But the Bible says, this very plainly in 1 John, that you have an anointing from God. And I'm speaking to you as if you are a child of God, as if you're born again by God's Spirit. You put your faith in who Jesus is and what he's done for you on the cross. If that's you, you are anointed. I'm not trying to say you're the same as King David. You're not. You're certainly not the same as Jesus Christ. But if you are in Christ, God will save you with his answer. God will save you from heaven. God will save you with his saving strength. God will save you with the strength that comes from his right hand. Not because you're so wonderful, but because you have an anointing, because you are in the ultimate anointed one, Jesus Christ. 
So this wasn't just for David. It was fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ. But it's not even just ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. It's extended out to those who are in Christ and have an anointing as well. All right, let's continue on. Verse 7 here. David, I just love this phrase. Um, Again, it gets into the we. So this is like said from the congregation of Israel. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You, You see, David knew what kings and the people usually trust in. They trust in human strength and they trust in the way it's often expressed. Back in David's day, military might was expressed in chariots and horses. Today, David might say something like this. Some trust in nuclear weapons. Some trust in cruise missiles. Others trust in tanks. It's just part of human nature to put our trust in these sophisticated armaments of our day, whatever our day is. But listen, David said, no, our trust. The people said this, our trust is going to be in the Lord, our God. You know, I just think of it, Alexander McLaren makes this point, how how for the normal Israeli soldier in the ancient world, they fought on foot for the most part. Chariots and horses must have seemed terrifying to the Israeli foot soldier. They were mighty, but the name of the Lord is mightier still. And for this reason, David said, no, I'm going to refuse to trust in chariots and in horses. Matter of fact, David knew that God had commanded in the law of Moses that the kings of Israel would not multiply horses for themselves, either to use in sort of cavalry or to pull war chariots. You'll find that in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16. So he said, no, we're not going to trust in chariots and horses, but instead, verse 7, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. David here is drawing a very strong contrast They trust in those things, but our trust is in God. Let me read to you a quote from uh, Bishop Horn, an Anglican commentator of uh, more than a hundred years ago. He says this, In the spiritual war in which we are all engaged, the first and necessary step to victory is to renounce all confidence in the wisdom and strength of nature and the world. And to remember that we can do nothing but in the name, by the merits, through the power, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. We've got to begin the same place that the people of Israel and David did in Psalm 20. They said, no, first we're going to renounce human wisdom, fleshly wisdom. We're going to renounce the chariots and the horses that so many people trust in. But instead, verse 7, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. David put his trust in the person, the character of God. He didn't carry the name of the Lord as sort of like this magic incantation. No, rather the name of God speaks of the comprehensive character of God. It's an expression of his faithfulness and his covenant with Israel. This, this, the character and the faithfulness of God was stronger to David. It was stronger to Israel than thousands of chariots or horses. Therefore, I I sense, I hope you do too, sort of a triumphant defiance in David when he says, but we will remember. Listen, he knew, we all know how easy it is to forget, how counterintuitive it is to human nature to trust in God instead of in human strength and resources. But David says, again, almost defiantly, but we will remember. And now verses 8 and 9 conclude with the beautiful note of triumph. Here we go, verses 8 and 9. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Now, I love verse 8, where it says, They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. David's trust in God could be justified for many reasons, but one of those reasons was simply pragmatic reasons. Trusting in God works, and David saw it. Those who trusted in chariots and horses have bowed down and fallen. They were defeated. But those who remember the name of the Lord have risen and stood upright. That's why David can say with such confidence in verse 9, Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. And again, this is the whole nation. Notice the we there. 
But the rescue that David and the people of Israel confidently sang of had not completely come. He still needed to cry out, save, Lord. But he still had trust in the anticipated answer of the Lord. All right, so here's our question. How does Psalm 20 point to Jesus Christ? Well, I almost feel a little bit silly asking a question because we've gone all through the psalm looking at how it points to the ultimate uh, Messiah, anointed one, Jesus Christ. But let me just kind of summarize it with three points. Again, not exhaustive, but three ways that Psalm 20 points to Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus offered the sacrifice that was always remembered and accepted before God. Do you remember that in verse three? May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Jesus offered the sacrifice that will always be remembered and always accepted before God. We we don't have to make a sacrifice for our own sins. We don't have to. We can't. It's vain to do. Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice, always remembered, always accepted. A beautiful fulfillment of verse 3. Secondly, Jesus is the one whose every petition, every prayer was answered. Did you see that in verse 5? May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. I see Jesus agonizing in the Garden of Eden, praying that God would strengthen him to pass the test, and he did. I see Jesus praying for Peter that he would not fall away when he was sifted, and he did not fall away. Yes, the Lord answers every petition made by Jesus. Now, I want to give you a reminder here. Those prayers are still being prayed for us by Jesus from heaven. Do you realize that? That Jesus Christ is praying for his people even now? And so this is a wonderful, wonderful promise. Then finally, Jesus is the ultimate anointed one. He's the Mashiach. He's the Messiah, rescued by God the Father in his vindication and resurrection. So when verse 6 says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed, we realize that not only was it speaking of David, it was speaking ultimately of Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters, this is an amazing psalm, Psalm 20, not only telling us of the great victory that God worked in King David, the ultimate victory that he worked in Jesus Christ, but it also speaks of our victory that we can have in Jesus Let's pray to that exact end right now. Father in heaven, I pray for everybody who views this or listens to this. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help them to truly put their trust in Jesus Christ, in who he is and what Jesus has done for them, that they would truly share in the surpassing victory of Jesus, our Messiah. We proclaim it, Lord, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of our God. We trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.